thank you very much, everybody. Um, and uh, start off by uh, thanking the organisers for accepting sponsorship by the Archaeological Society for this <coughs> session. Uh, of necess necessity nowadays, um, my interests are uh, strictly confined to local ones. And so uh, what I'll be focusing on today um, is applying existing theories and models to explaining local data um, rather than trying to come up with any brilliant new theories. Um, so apologies if um, I disappoint any of you. Uh, theoretical archaeology is not my natural habitat. Um, and as I say, what uh, I say may sound a little bit conventional. Um, and um, that warning goes um, um, especially to the usual suspects um, in the audience who will have heard part of this talk before. So, uh, the topics I want to uh, cover this afternoon are Chester as a crossroad to Britain, um, economic development around Chester, and the local nature of local society. The first key theoretical concept is that of uh, the long durée, um, which is a fairly familiar one. Um, the grandiose idea of Chester as a long-term crossroad of Britain at the junction of the Midlands, the North, Wales and the Irish Sea region wasn't, as you might suspect, uh, cooked up by uh, marketing Cheshire, but it is actually um, a phrase taken from the Victoria County history. Uh, uh, it was uh, certainly valid from Roman times, if not earlier, until the English Civil War, and it's reflected in the city's later uh, role as a hub of ten railway lines. In Roman times, ro roads radiated to Roxeter, Mid and North Wales, uh, Will, Warrington, and, and Manchester. What's now the Rudy Racecourse with a tidal pool providing a harbour. Um, in later times, adverse winds and shallow channels of the estuary led to the use of outports further down the, uh, the estuary. However, uh, such an outport already existed in uh, Roman times, and in fact before uh, at Mells on the end of the Will Peninsula. And arguably, we should not think of it as being in a different category uh, from the later outports. In the 4th century BC, Pythias of Marseille seems to have sailed up through the Irish Sea towards Iceland. And um, he may not have been the first Medi Mediterranean person to explore these waters. Uh, there are references to Ireland in Avianus <coughs> or Mar Maritima of the 4th century AD, which may go back to the um, 6th century BC. Uh, and it's worth mentioning uh, a conjecture by Dr. Caitlin Green um, <coughs> that both um, Britannia, Prydain, and uh, Hibernia, Iwerion may in fact have Punic origins. Um, a 5th century BC wine amphora from Marseille um, was supposedly dredged up from the D estuary uh, about 1900. Second to 1st century uh, BC Siculo Punic and Breton coins have been found at Mels, and a 2nd century BC Mediterranean anchor stock um, has been found off Port Vallon on the south coast of the Italian Peninsula of North Wales. The known legionary fortress at Chester seems to have been built um, at the completion, not the start, the completion of the conquest of Wales and Northern England. However, early coins from Holt, which is the next easy crossing uh, point of the day, uh, about 12 kilometres upstream from Chester, and from Mells, may be evidence of early military campaigning in North Wales and for naval operations along the Lancashire coast. Uh, more recently, the discovery of a horde of early Roman imper imperial coins and of British status near Malpas, 21 kilometres uh, up the Dee Valley from Chester, may attest the flight of the um, British war leader Caratarchus northwards towards the Brigantes after his defeat in the marches in the late 40s. In short, in considering Chester's strategic importance, we need to focus not just on the present day city, but on the whole of the Lower Dee Valley. No sooner 
both Chester built, then the advance then the advance to the north seemingly reduced it to a rearward base with just an in internal security function. However, and this where we come into modern politics yet again, this is to ignore the existence of Ireland. In most accounts of Roman Britain, Ireland only appears uh, twice in Tacitus' bibliography of his father-in-law, when as governor of Britain, Agricola considered an invasion and possibly carried out a raid from Chester in AD 82, and as the home of 4th century raiders, uh, prompting the construction of a watchtower on Hollyhead Mountain, uh, the fort in Hollyhead town, town Kai Gubby, and the possible stores compound at Henwalii at Kynarvon. However, the dating evidence, poor though it is, from recent investigations by the Gwynedd Archaeological Trust of fortlets along the north coast of Anglesey, suggest a longer lasting uh, concern with security. Jacqueline Cahill Wilson has drawn attention to Roman finds from the Greater Dublin uh, area of Ireland, strategically, strategically opposite Chester, Mells, and the fort at Carnarvon. In addition, uh, Ptolemy's map here um, shows that a considerable amount was known about Ireland, um, inland areas as well as along the coast, presumably in part from the traders who were mentioned by Tacitus, but possibly, as we've seen, going back to much earlier times. The importance of the western seaways of Britain in general in Roman times and the question of trade between the Empire and Ireland <coughs> are disputed and I think understudied. Uh, Professor Michael Fulford has argued that most imports from the continent, <coughs> including Trestle 20 and 3, would have been <coughs> moved overland um, from the southeast and that black burnished ware was transported overland from Dorset to the Bristol Channel up the Severn to Roxeter, and then on uh, overland to Chester, from where it may have been distributed um, by sea further north. However, Dressel 20 Amphrey are in fact found in Ireland, as is Severn Valley ware, and it would not be surprising if um, black burnished ware were, uh, were to be recognised there as well in the future. Even a Roman fortlet has been suggested guarding copper mines near Dublin, so, arising from all of this, how was trade between the continent, Britain, and Ireland, um, which had obviously gone on in some form for centuries, uh, impacted by empire and the uh, uh, construction of a frontier, in inverted commas? Uh, did it increase or did it decrease? And how was it organised? And did Chester act as a centre for the redistribution by sea of products and supplies that had reached it over, overland. All of this makes more plausible David Mason's suggestion that Chester was originally planned as a centre for the government of a province that was intended to include Ireland, but only Scotland up to the uh, Fourth Clyde Isthmus, with the uncompleted elliptical building and Imago Mundi or imperial exhibition at the heart of the fortress. And the elliptical building is um, uh, above and left from the headquarters building, which I can't really reach from here. Ireland was a constant factor in Chester's history um, in later centuries, from medieval, early medieval times to the Fenian plot to seize Chester Castle in 1867. And I think it's time to reinstate it in mainstream studies of the Roman period. According to Whitaker, Roman frontiers were established in broadly defined ag agriculturally marginal zones, <coughs> beyond which the logistical problems of occupation outweighed the likely profit that might be gained from uh, precious metals or whatever. <coughs> This implies the need for local development in the wake of conquest uh, to avoid heavy ongoing supply costs. Certainly, at the time of the conquest, Cheshire seemed to have been a relatively <coughs> had a relatively small population and a flattish social hierarchy, 
and so socially and agriculturally may not have been attractive to occupy in its own right. On the other hand, there is increasing evidence for late pre-Roman Iron, Iron Age occupation in Wirral, and Kevin Coote's talk on Poulton uh, should warn us against over-emphasising <coughs> material poverty. <coughs> Moreover, Chester was near the, <coughs> the profitable silver lead mines in Flintshire and was near the copper mines of Old Liege. Militarily, it also anchored the southwestern corner of the former Brigantian client kingdom. If the occupation of Ireland was ever more than a passing thought, it may be that Chester fits into Whitaker's model even more comfortably. The empire could have been extended even further by crossing the sea, uh, but the venture was never deemed pro profitable enough to be a priority. The desirable desirability of autarky, the ability of a city <coughs> to feed itself from its own hinterland, was a common topic in classical discourse. But the vagaries of Mediterranean climate made the reality unusual, and dispersed hinterlands uh, became commonplace as cities increased in size. The same problem faced military, Roman military garrisons even in northern Europe. As long ago as 1975, Bill Manning argued for the ability of auxiliary forts in Wales to be fed from the immediately surrounding countryside. However, feeding legionary garrisons ten times as big was a totally different matter. The long distance supply of garrisons on the Lower Rhine has been studied over many years by Tom Dirks and Nico Roymans. Given what we know at the moment about local rural settlements in the Chester area, it seems <coughs> that these were probably small scale, um, uh, they were not particularly dense, and uh, didn't show a, an excessive amount of specialisation. And so they were unlikely to be able to, to have sustained the garrison, especially in cereals. The rural <coughs> settlement of Rome, <coughs> excuse me, the Royal Settlement of Roman Britain project sees the northern garrisons as a whole being supported in cereals from the Midlands and southern England, West Anglian Plain, Kent, Thames Estuary, and later Salisbury Plain, which adopted a spelt and cattle strategy. However, however at the moment, uh, we haven't made an awful lot of progress in linking specific producer and consumer areas. It's difficult to quantify levels of agricultural production However, it is quite clear that at the time of the Roman conquest, other forms of production in Cheshire, as elsewhere in the northwest, were inadequate. Thus, we see the establishment of tile and pottery kilns at Holt and a direct um, army control, <coughs> other unlocated pottery kilns across the Cheshire Plain, and a more generalised independent manufacturing settlement at Wildesbore uh, on the outskirts of Warrington. There was also large scale. Um, Salt production at Northwich, Middlewich, and Nantwich, although far, how far salt was the end product rather than cured meat and processed hides, it's difficult to say. This local pottery production um, uh, tailed off after the later second century and gave way to uh, more distant pro uh, products such as black burnished one from Dorset and Mortaria from Warwickshire. From a theoretical point of view, all this could be seen as a move towards globalisation, i.e. specialisation over wide areas in the context of empire, although building on a climatically enforced habit of connectivity that had been seen in the Mediterranean area for centuries. Reverting to the countryside for the moment, we shouldn't ignore the, the changes in rural settlement that did take place in Cheshire. <coughs> there seems to have been a greater increase in the number of settlements in the late 1st, early 2nd centuries than in some other parts of the country, followed by a decline in the 3rd century. Ultimately, this surely relate, reflects the level of military occupation. A complex farmstead, the first recognised in this area, set in a rectilin rectilinear field pattern which is suggestive of centuriation has been found at Satan just to the southeast of Chester. Now, and 
uh, this possibly this is the first archaeological manifestation of the Prata Legionis. Agricultural production um, there seems to have been focused on cattle, presumably to supply the fortress, and the width of the roads between the fields suggests that they were designed as droveways for animals rather than as cart tracks. Corn drives at the roadside settlements at Heronbridge, Pla Plascock near Wrexham, and the villa eaten by Tarpley suggest some specialisation in cereal production, but at Birch Heath, near the Eaton Villa, the focus was more on cheese production. Again, a priori, one would expect um, quite a lot of settlement in and around Chester. However, the area that one can currently conjecture for the Cannabine, only about 10 hectares, seems too small to accommodate traders, veterans, their wives and families. Uh, which one um, can easily calculate should have been in the region about 6,000 people. And unless many of them retired elsewhere to Britain um, or on the continent, it's likely that they too lived on small farms in the surrounding countryside. <clears throat> the shortage of villas in areas such as Chester has often been commented on with explanations such as indifference or hostility to Roman forms of display, oppressive taxes, and short-term land tenure. Around Chester, there is certainly a shortage of architectural display of any sort, public or private, apart from by the military. And we uh, can uh, contrast this uh, with uh, the grandiose buildings down at Roxeter, only 40 miles away. However, rural sites in West Cheshire seem to produce more pottery than is found north of the Mersey and perhaps in North Shropshire, while objects of personal adornment and coins are also more common as port portable antiquity scheme finds. My current interpretation is the countryside of West Cheshire saw a uh, continu continuation of the relatively, I mean, emphasise a relatively egalitarian society of the late pre-Roman Iron Age, supplement, supplemented by the settlement of veterans who may have been relatively well off, but not greatly so, and would have had and perhaps diffused a taste for the sort of everyday objects they were uh, familiar with during their military service. The nature of taxation and trade with urban markets in kind, <coughs> through barter or in coin, could also have been important in influencing Roman lifestyles. Taxation in kind could have left traditional lifestyles relatively unchanged, whereas taxation in money, with the army buying supplies, could have led to a more uh, widely monetized economy with accompanying social change. However, army demand always seems to have been the motor of the local economy, and this declined before it could have any fundamental transformative effect. So uh, where do I think uh, we need to focus re um, uh, research in the future? Uh, first of all, obviously on uh, uh, British links with Ireland or vi and vice versa. Um, and secondly, on the variety and nature of rural settlement around here. Um, perhaps across the late pre-Roman Iron Age to Roman uh, bo uh, boundary. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>